Number three, the Honourable David Cunman. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, to the Minister of Finance, further to his reply to oral question number six yesterday that, quote, taxes paid on some capital gains in New Zealand, close quote, what exemptions exist to the current taxation of capital gains income? The Honourable Bill English. Well, Mr Speaker, as the member may know, our tax system doesn't work uh, in this respect by exemptions. Uh, some capital, some capital uh, gain is classified in the Income Tax Act as income and therefore taxed as income rates. One very important exception exists. One very important exception exists though. KiwiSaver funds don't currently pay tax on their capital gains from trading New Zealand or Australian shares. This exemption helps boost KiwiSaver returns and provides a level playing field for local investment. However, a new more widespread capital gains tax applied to the sale of all shares would mean the end of this exemption, and KiwiSaver funds would have to pay capital gains tax, lowering their investment returns. The Honourable David Speaker, Cameron. Mr Speaker, given that the Prime Minister says, and I quote, it is not true that New Zealanders are not taxed on capital gains that they might incur, how much is raised annually from the intention test, and how much capital gains income goes untaxed? The Honourable Bill English. Well, Mr Speaker, with respect to the intentions test, the government over the last couple of budgets has given uh, quite a bit more money to IRD to pursue uh, those people who are in fact trading in property uh, but claiming that they uh, aren't trading in property because if they aren't trading then they wouldn't be paying capital gains or taxes on their capital gains. Uh, and IRD advise that they've been quite successful in, in extracting considerably more tax from those property speculators. The point of order, the Honourable David Cunningham. Mr Speaker, respectfully submit the Minister hasn't addressed the question, which was to the point of trying to get him to quantify how much tax was raised from a particular uh, order, aspect order, of order, the capital order, gains order, test order, he no, says occurred. Order, it's sufficient. If the member really wanted those figures, and he's perfectly entitled to seek those figures, he would need to have put them down the primary question. I can't expect the Minister uh, to, given you know, where uh, a question simply asks uh, for the Minister to uh, uh, the, the base of the, of the primary question day to have those sort of figures is unreasonable. And if he wants those figures, then the, they should, the primary question should be different. The Honourable David Cunliffe. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr Speaker, wasn't the Minister's statement that, and I quote, a comprehensive of capital gains tax is the right thing to do, and admission that the current system offers a tax advantage to property that distorts investment decisions and hurts the economy. The Honourable Bill English. Speaker, as I explained uh, to the member yesterday, uh, many tax theorists advance a comprehensive capital gains tax uh, as a way of, uh, as a way of uh, raising more revenue. Uh, with respect to property, uh, as I've explained to the member, the government took a series of measures, including the one referred to in the last question, that is, more resources for IRD to pursue those people who have been voiding taxation on the trading of property and also a number of measures in Budget 2010 which I understand are collecting around $800 million this year from the investment property sector. Uh, we have been keen to take, we've taken moderate measures to increase the effective tax rate on property to assist the rebalancing of the economy. Speaker. Honourable David Cunliffe. Mr Speaker, given that the Minister is on record as supporting a comprehensive capital gains tax, given that the Minister could not tell the House earlier in this question what the exemptions are to the capital gains tax that he and the Prime Minister say currently exists, can I ask the Minister in what respect is the capital gains tax he believes currently is in place not comprehensive? The Honourable Bill English. Well, Mr Speaker, as I pointed out to the member, the uh, Tax Act doesn't work by having a capital gains tax and then exemptions from it. it. What it does is classify some forms of capital income as income that should be taxed, and then actually the rest of the tax law has been determined by a series of court decisions uh, which try to determine the difference between income, uh, uh, ordinary income and capital income. But one exemption, as I pointed, well, one exception, as I pointed out, is uh, that KiwiSaver funds don't pay capital gains tax on Australian or New Zealand traded shares, and I think under his proposition they will. No, well, that... 
I have uh, called the Honourable David Cannon. Speaker, again, to the Minister in the simplest possible terms, does he stand by his statement that a comprehensive capital gains tax is a good thing? And if so, does he believe that New Zealand currently has a comprehensive capital gains tax? And if what respect? If not, why not? The Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, as I pointed out in a number of as I pointed out in the comments he's referring to, a number of people have advocated a comprehensive capital gains tax. Uh, I understand the member the member isn't advocating a comprehensive capital gains tax, he's advocating one full of holes, exemptions and exceptions and multiple rates, which would be a nightmare for compliance. Point of Point of order, the novel David right, I've used, as you can see, several additional supplementaries effectively to get the Minister order, to answer. Order. Us. Order. I invite the Honourable David Cunliffe kind of, please to, to view the, the, the tape of, of the last supplementary question he asked and to reflect on the, 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 the first two statements he made in the supplementary question he asked. He, he, made, he made all sorts of allegations about the Minister's uh, view of, of, of capital gains tax and, and other matters. Having done that, the Minister had absolute open licence to say almost anything he liked about the, the Member's uh, party's policies because the Member in asking his question made allegations about the, the Minister's policies. So uh, I just ask him to have a look at the, the, the question he asked because there's no way I can assist him when he asks that kind of question. Question, oh sorry, Aaron Gilmore, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Supplementary question to the Minister. Has he seen any reports on exemptions to the tax rules on capital gains on share trading? The Honourable Billings. Mr Speaker, I've seen a couple of interesting reports. One is from uh, the Finance Minister in the last Government uh, releasing a, a Government policy which we have maintained. Capital gains on New Zealand and Australian shares held via a vehicle like a managed fund will no longer be taxed. This is important for encouraging people to save through KiwiSaver. That was a policy position taken by Dr Michael Cullen and remains current policy. The second is from Labor's finance spokesman David Cunliffe, who told the New Zealand Shareholders Association that under Labor's proposed policy, KiwiSaver funds would, quote, tend to be taxed on the capital gains. So I think it is now Labor's policy that capital gains on Australian and New Zealand traded funds will be taxed and that will punish 1.7 million KiwiSavers. Order, order. Unlike the previous question, that was a question from a colleague and uh, from the member's own party and he should not uh, OK reported accurately what, uh, what was, had been the report he'd received but then where he erred was to uh, express his view about uh, KiwiSavers being punished. Uh, that was beyond uh, uh, the, the, the provisions of the standing orders. Uh, Point of order, the Honourable Trevor Mayor. Mr. Speaker, again, I'd like to invite you to review the tape on that one and see whether you called the Minister to order three or four times while he studiously avoided looking at you. When the member's own behaviour is perfect, I will uh, take his advice on, on, that, on that matter. Uh, question number, point of order, the Honourable Trevor Mallard. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I invite you to reflect on that and see whether you should address points of order raised or provide a commentary which sounds more like an Australian cricket commentary. Order. I accept the member's view, but uh, if the member wants me to uh, uh, take his points of order seriously, he needs to behave most times seriously. And that is, that is you know, it's, it's a very simple matter. These, the matter the member raised is a matter for the Speaker to decide. I, it's for the Speaker to decide whether or not the, uh, the Minister uh, did not respond quickly enough to my being on my feet. I admonished the, the Minister for uh, uh, going into area that the supplementary question did not allow, and as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of the matter. Now, the, if the member chooses... All I say to the member is uh, if he... His, uh, just reflect on his own behaviour if he's going to criticise the behaviour of other members in this House. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Point of order, the Honourable Trevor Mallard. Uh, Mr Speaker, I invite you to consider whether it is appropriate for the Speaker to express prejudice order. before the considering will a now point of order. The member will now resume his seat right away. I have to deal with the behaviour of members in this House all the time. And I've been, I think, quite generous to the shadow leader of the House and some of his behaviour in this place. I noted last night 
In the committee, the member was told to leave the House and argued with the chairman. The shadow leader of the House argued with the chairman instead of leaving when he was told to leave. Uh, the, you know, members need to think about their own behaviour if they are to be taken seriously in this place. Had the point of order been a serious point of order, I would have uh, acted on it immediately. The Honourable Billing, which is a point of order. Yeah, well, Mr Speaker, speaking to the point of order, I, 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 if you are going to reflect as the member requested, I think you should reflect on the latitude that that member uh, seems to get in this House. Uh, as you pointed out, yesterday he was asked to leave the chamber by a no, order, I don't person in the chair order, and didn't do order, so. Order, I don't think we should take this matter any further. I've dealt with the Speaker and that's the end of the matter. I made it very clear to the members of the House that I do not view bad behaviour favourably. And when a member, as the Honourable Trevor Mallard did, raised a point of order claiming another member had behaved uh, poorly, the, I, I just suggested because I did not believe the offence was so bad the member should reflect on his own behaviour. It seems quite a few members of the House actually share my view, to be fair to say. But that is the end of the matter. I just want to see behaviour in this House improve a little. In recent times it has got poor. And it is not, it, we are not seen well in the public eye when we allow that to happen. And if members doubt uh, about the behaviour of certain members, look at the television replays, look at the tapes. I do it all the time, and at times it is not good. And I just at times have to make it clear to members they should pick their game up, because the public do not like seeing their parliament behaving badly. Now, if I've offended uh, the member, I apologise for offending the member, but you know, the behaviour hasn't been very good. Uh, I'll be interested to know what the point of order is about. The Honourable Clayton Cosgrove. Uh, I'm about to advise you of it, sir. Um, the point of order, sir, I just... Uh, and I would like some clarification. I, I think in the exchange we've had, without wishing to relitigate it, the issue, sir, is simply this. No-one is challenging your right to make a ruling. It's absolutely correct. And we would support you making a ruling, sir. The issue is what follows or, or prefaces that ruling inevitably is a commentary. And you may see that, sir, as your right and privilege as an evolving speaker's role, but the difficulty is that that commentary, sir, uh, often uh, becomes a narrative well outside what could be seen to be judicious and impartial. And I, is your right to make a ruling, sir? You are the referee, but you are not in the game, I put to you, sir. I'll hear the Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, as someone who's been on the other end recently of, um, of decisions of the Speaker, I think it's uh, fair to say we need to reassert a standard which is held in this House for 20 years, and that is the impartiality of the Speaker is not questioned. Uh, that has never been a custom of this House, and the opposition are starting to get into that. I sometimes disagree strongly with the Speaker and have cause, had cause to do so recently. Uh, but questioning the impartiality of the Speaker takes us down a road which leads to disorder and it, sh it should not be occurring. We can disagree with the Speaker but not question impartiality. Point of order, the Honourable Rick Barker. Point of order, Mr Speaker. I don't take many points of order, but that point of order is very provocative. I sat on that side of the House where that member is now and heard member after member after member of the National Party question the partiality of the Right Honourable Jonathan Hunt and the partiality of the Honourable Margaret Wilson. I was galled by it then, and I'm even more galled by the member saying that they did not do it. I just want to say, lay that on the record. I accept the member order. is correct. We should not question the partiality, but from that order. member, order. never. Order. I think that the House has expressed a view, and all I, all I say to all members is that if I've offended a member, I apologise for that. But we do have to improve the behaviour. And if members think that some of the behaviour we've seen in recent times is acceptable, I'm sorry, I disagree. And the only way I can make it very clear to members is to make it clear to them that the behaviour is becoming unacceptable. And I just invite members to have a look at the tapes, to see what the public sees, and to see why we lose respect. That's all I'm asking. And at times, if, if comments may offend members, be assured it's not without a lot of provocation because I, I have been very tolerant of some members' behaviour. And I just want to see the behaviour improve a little.
And it's time now for question of point of order, the Honourable